All right, well, uh, thank you all for coming to this uh, brown bag lunch. Uh, Columbia made plain, referendum results, ELA negotiations, and future directions for policy. Uh, my name is Christopher Pitt. I'm a Next, Letter Fe Next Leader Fellow here at uh, IPS. I'm working on the Global Economy Project uh, under Sarah Anderson. And we all want to welcome you here today uh, to this brown bag lunch. Um, on October 27th, the ELN, or the National Liberation Army, uh, guerrillas began an operation to release their last confirmed hostage, a promise announced in the wake of the inauguration of peace talks scheduled to begin in Ecuador in November. Um, additionally, at the beginning of October, uh, Colombians narrowly voted to reject a peace agreement uh, negotiated between the Colombian government and the FARC in a nationwide plebiscite. Uh, given little attention in this backdrop is the part of the agreement that ensured the rights and interests of Afro-descendant and indigenous peoples will be respected in the fact that the majority of the yes votes came from Afro-descended territories and territories hit most uh, by the violence. <clears throat> uh, today, uh, we're going to discuss some agreements that were reached with the FARC, uh, how and why the results of the referendum occurred, uh, the perspectives and prospects for Afro-Colombians, and how the process with the ELN could be improved and what's expected of the ELN. At uh, this time, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, via Skype, uh, we have Charo Mina Rojas. Uh, she's a Colombian human rights activist with the National Afro-Cuban Peace Council and Black Communities Process. Uh, to my right, we have Michael Paulberg. Uh, he's a journalist for The Guardian who witnessed the recent plebiscite in Colombia. And to my left, we have San Ho Tree. He's an IPS fellow and director of the Drug Policy Project. So without further ado, uh, we'd like to begin, and we're going to start with Mike. OK, uh, thanks. Uh, so I have a PowerPoint. Um, don't worry, this is not a scripted uh, thing, just to have some, some maps and pictures in case uh, you guys are interested. Um, so I was in uh, Columbia, not officially as a journalist, but as a, an election observer. Uh, for the organization American States. Uh, now, I have to say I don't represent the organization American States. They are very uh, careful about you know, their neutrality, so uh, I'm speaking as myself and not as a representative. Um, this was, uh, uh, it was a surprising uh, plebiscite. Uh, I think uh, people here would uh, probably see a lot of things in common with uh, things that happened in this country uh, recently. Um, which I'll get into, but first a little bit of a background as to uh, the conflict. I think a lot of people in the room and, and watching uh, know this, but just to, to remind everyone, um, the conflict in Colombia between the government and rebel groups, primarily the FARC, uh, is the longest running uh, insurgency maybe in the world, or at least in Latin America, depending on how you measure it, going on officially since the uh, early 60s, uh, maybe unofficially since the uh, period of violence that followed the assassination of liberal politician Jorge Gaetan. Um, which uh, convinced many people on the left, not just socialists, but liberals as well, that uh, electoral politics were doomed and uh, armed uh, struggle was the, uh, the only way to, uh, uh, to initiate change. Um, this uh, started in a state that I was observing in called Tolima, which, uh, which is the birthplace of the FARC, uh, which is uh, where a so-called uh, Republic of Marcatalia was, uh, was formed, which was really originally a peasant commune in the, in the 50s, um, which Manuel Marulanda, the former, the, the former head of the FARC, uh, you know, now killed, uh, was uh, uh, was organizing, and uh, later the Colombian military, with U.S. military help, uh, came in and uh, and destroyed it. And they, uh, the rebels, later went into the hills for the FARC and have been fighting ever since. Uh, the FARC, at its high point, had about 20,000 uh, troops uh, in the 1998 to 2002 er uh, uh, era when they controlled. Uh, part of that country about the size of Switzerland, called El Caguan. Um, they now have maybe about 6,500 troops. Uh, they've essentially been militarily defeated. They really haven't had the, uh, the ability to overthrow the Colombian government, probably ever, uh, certainly not recently. Um, uh, they don't really have the technical capacity. Uh, just as an illustration, uh, one of their more famous uh, uh, weapons was something called the donkey bomb, which is literally a donkey with explosive you know, strapped to it. They would kind of you know, push towards the nearest police station and blow up. Um, so they've, they've had the ability to create, you know, kind of low-level violence and problems for the government for a long time. The Santos government recognized this and said, you know, it's time to, to make a deal, and uh, President Manuel, Manuel Santos has made this his, uh, his legacy, and which he recently won the Nobel Peace Prize for. 
So uh, they've been negotiating since 2002. Um, the negotiations covered uh, five major areas, uh, which uh, included land reform, although the government will not actually call it land reform. That's too controversial. Um, they call it propiedad de tierra, but it's, it's really land reform. Um, uh, drugs, uh, which uh, Sanjo will talk about uh, uh, from the you know, international context. Um, uh, transitional justice, uh, including justice for uh, victims of the violence on all sides. Um, a political participation, uh, representation of the FARC in uh, upcoming politics as a political party, um, and just the implementation of the, uh, of the uh, process. Now, oddly enough, the least controversial parts of this, the parts that did not really, did not take a while to negotiate and people did not tend to get upset about were the things that actually kind of sent the FARC into the jungle in the first place, which is uh, land reform and, you know, the unequal access to land by peasants. Um, the parts that were most controversial were the justice issues, basically, um, justice for victims of, uh, of violence, uh, massacres, kidnappings, uh, all sorts of things, um, as well as the political participation of the FARC. The FARC is, uh, frankly, widely loathed in Colombia. They have maybe about, you know, 5% uh, popular support, including in many places that people, you know, you would imagine would be sources of support for the guerrillas, uh, you know, like rural peasants. Um, uh, largely do not support the FARC. Uh, people I spoke with in Tolima said that, uh, you know, in the earlier days they had a, a better reputation. They were, had kind of more of a Robin Hood reputation with steel from the rich, people the poor. Um, after, uh, in the 90s, they got more involved in, uh, in drugs. Not so much drug cultivation, but taxing of drugs. And um, uh, as well as other more predatory activities such as kidnapping. Um, this made them highly unpopular. Um, this was also in uh, by the way, in reaction to a vacuum created by the uh, destruction of the Medellin cartel, Pablo Escobar's cartel, um, which created, you know, a whole area of uh, drug cultivation, which other armed groups, the FARC, but also very largely right-wing paramilitaries, got involved in. So, um, anyway, that brings us uh, up to the present day. Uh, the uh, the plebiscite happened in October. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, before the plebiscite was even voted on, there was a there was a they actually signed the peace deal um, in uh, Cartagena. That's uh, Raul Castro. You can, you can see with uh, with Juan Manuel Santos. Actually, could we go back to the yeah uh, Santos and Timochenko, the uh, current head of the uh, of the FARC. That's not his real name. He's named after a Soviet uh, a general from World War II. Um, incidentally, this optic was pretty bad for the conservative part of the country, which is a large part of the country. The fact that the negotiations were going on in Havana um, made people, and largely in secret, uh, made a lot of people on the right very. Suspicious. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, that's in Cartagena. That's the peace flag, which with a white uh, a white banner underneath it. Uh, we can go to the next one. Um, so this is what the polls showed before the uh, the plebiscite actually took place. The yes vote was supposed to win by a landslide. I mean, the, the second to last one showed yes, winning seventy two percent. The last one sixty six percent. And then we can go to the next one. This is how they actually voted. Uh, uh, the no vote won fifty point two percent to forty nine point. Uh, seven eight percent with about thirty eight percent electoral participation. Now this is low even by Colombian standards. Colombia is one of uh, the Latin American countries that does not have mandatory voting. Um, so even in the last presidential election, about maybe fifty percent of the country voted, but thirty eight percent is pretty low. Um, in previous elections, uh, a lot of the get out the vote is done through clientelistic, basically vote buying uh, means. So uh, you know, like political parties will throw barbecues, they'll, they'll hand out gifts. I was talking with uh, local politicians, they said the best way to buy votes um, is actually by giving out home electronics and appliances, because if you just give out cash, people just spend the cash and they forget who gave you the cash, but if you give them a TV, they're going to look at the TV every day and say, remember, you know, Governor Nariño gave me this TV. Um, this normally happens in, in elections. Um, this election, there were no <coughs> candidates running, and the parties were not running. They had committees for the yes and the no, which were ad hoc committees, largely made up of uh, yes, Yes, committees made up of the parties support the government, no committees made up of the opposition. But there, no one really had a great incentive to buy votes, and so that didn't really happen, so people largely didn't vote. There was also a hurricane in the North Coast, um, which uh, severely depressed uh, uh, electoral participation. The North Coast uh, largely voted yes, so it's arguable that if that hadn't happened, uh, yes would have won. But in any case, this was highly unexpected, and after this came out, there was all this soul searching. Uh, we can go to the next, next slide. There's the yes people, and the next slide is no people obviously were, were much happier. Um, the, uh, the, the no vote was seen as a kind of, you know, revenge of the, uh, uh, 
you know, kind of the, the conservative right wing, but also uh, a kind of maybe rural dispossessed. I mean, this is, it's, it's not really entirely true, and this is kind of what we see going on in, in this election. Um, but if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see how people voted. So um, green is yes, orange is no. Um, yes won in Bogota, the capital, which is where the government is, and um, I wouldn't say call the government left wing, but it's you know relatively more liberal than the opposition. Um, also uh, tended to win in the areas on the uh, periphery. Um, so uh, so these include areas where there has been a large rebel presence, um, as well as many of the worst massacres, which happened in uh, kind of Putumayo, uh, Calca, Nariño, Valpes, um, Choco. Uh, but then uh, the no vote won in Antioquia, which is where Medellin is, which is the uh, seat of uh, Alvaro Uribe, who is the, main, the former president, a very right-wing guy, who, uh, who was, uh, you know, he, he's the hardliner who takes credit for militarily defeating the FARC. And um, he has, you know, a cult of personality, and people there love him. Uh, so in many ways this is a kind of, and Bogotá and Medellin have kind of always had this rivalry, so in many ways this mirrored the rivalry. Uh, between the two, but in other ways, how the violence happened, which I'll get into in different areas, uh, probably also affected the vote. So we can go to the next slide. Um, here's just another uh, map we can see. You know, in this case, red is yes, blue is no. The big bubble in the middle is uh, Bogota. The largest blue bubble is uh, is Medellin. And we can go to the next one too. Uh, so, anyway, this, the question is, how much was this simply a proxy for national politics between Uribe on the left, uh, excuse me, Santos on the left, and Uribe on the, uh, in the no? Um, uh, Uribe was campaigning strongly against this and his party uh, as well, the uh, Centro Democrático, and uh, he was basically saying, taking this line of, we don't negotiate with terrorists, and uh, which, incidentally, is totally false. He negotiated with, uh, with uh, paramilitaries, uh, who were very much terrorists themselves. Uh, incidentally, he kind of screwed them over as well, which is interesting. He, uh, he gave a lot of them amnesty, but then after, uh, after they, uh, a lot of them had laid down their weapons, um, he, uh, he ended up extraditing a bunch of them to the United States. Uh, so uh, there was an interview with one of the former uh, AUC commanders. Um, they asked him what he thought about the FARC peace deal, and he said you know, he recommended to the rebels, make sure you get the agreement in writing. Um, but of course that complicates, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of trust problems, understandably. In addition to the fact that uh, in, uh, uh, in the 80s, a uh, number of FARC rebels did uh, demobilize, um, formed a political party called the Patriotic Union, and all of them were pretty much massacred by paramilitaries. So there's good reason for them to be suspicious about entering into democratic politics. Uh, anyway, if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that the... Uh, uh, the areas that voted yes and no pretty much correspond with the areas that voted for uh, Santos versus uh, Zuluaga, which was his right-wing opponent in the 2014 elections. Um, so you can go to the next one, too. Uh, the yes vote also tended to correspond with areas where the rebels have a presence. Uh, you can't really see very well, but there are a bunch of green dots uh, where, uh, uh, where the FARC have presence, and those tended to go more for... Uh, the yes. Um, however, if you look at how uh, how people actually suffered during the conflict, you see red and blue marks all over. You know the the size of the blue marks are uh, kind of the number of, of victims, and this would include everything from violence to kidnappings to forced displacements. Um, basically, people, everyone in Colombia was affected by the violence, one way or the other. Um, and the areas that were most affected by excuse by the war, people most most affected by the violence, the massacres. Uh, for the most part, tended to vote yes. But in a lot of areas in the interior which voted no, um, people were also affected, but in ways that were um, maybe more like uh, I would describe. They tended to see the rebels as kind of like the local mafia. They would, they would engage mostly in extortion um, and kidnapping. Um, people were not so scared for their lives, uh, but uh, they definitely did not like the rebels. They definitely did not trust any peace deal made between the government, which is incidentally very unpopular. Um, Santos is widely popular in the rest of the world, but he has about a, I don't know, 10% approval rating in, uh, in Colombia. So the last thing he wanted was for this plebiscite to end up being a referendum on his own rule, and it turned out largely to be. Okay, so we can go to the next one. Uh, oh, this is a uh, coca cultivation. So you can see in uh, one of the areas with the largest uh, co coca cultivation here actually voted no, um, incidentally. So this is another proxy for, you know, not just rebels, but, you know, armed group. Uh, presence in uh, in much of the country. Incidentally, there still are paramilitaries in the country. 
the government officially designates them criminal gangs uh, because any paramilitary that did not uh, uh, disarm, they consider them just to be criminals. But they're essentially doing the same thing as they've always done. Um, we can go to the next one. So this is where I was. Um, I was in Tolima, which is uh, which is the state where the park was born down in the south. This is the southern areas where we call the Republic of Marcatali was. Um, it's had a FARC presence continually since the, uh, the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, the uh, the uh, 21st Front, the FARC is organized into block, five blocks and maybe about 60 fronts. Um, the 21st Front is in the, uh, the western side of it, the 25th Front is, is on the east. Um, they, uh, this is a coffee growing and uh, cattle ranching area. Um, they tend to tax both of those. Incidentally, the, the FARC does not, you know, they, and, and paramilitaries and every armed group in Colombia tend to tax whatever is the most profitable business in the region. So I was also in a place called Casanare, which is an oil producing region, and they would tend to tax petroleum. Um, I've read reports that actually illegal mining is now a larger source of income for the rebels than, than coca uh, is. Anyway, um, this area voted no, and it voted no 60-40, uh, uh, which is interesting considering that the rebels have been there the longest. Uh, I was in, I think we can go to the next slide. Uh, that's, uh, that's just, it's a mountainous area you can see for, uh, for coffee cultivation. There's a little peace uh, uh, monument in, in the middle. You go to the next one. Uh, here's some, uh, some propaganda uh, for, for the yes and the no in, in the area. Um, you can see the, the no people were very, uh, I don't know, passionate. Uh, you can say this is saying uh, we're, about, we're two steps away from hell um, if you vote yes. Um, this is uh, Cajamarca. So this is, a, this is an area, this is a town that I was in that was outright controlled by the rebels for about, I don't know, 10 years ago. Um, and then they were later chased out, killed by the paramilitaries. Um, but people there talk about how, you know, the rebels, they, they ran their own court system. They had, uh, they had a kind of like marital courts where people, if they had marital disputes, would go to the rebels and, you know, they would resolve these disputes and tell people, you know, like, if you stop, stop cheating on your wife or we'll kill you. Um, but then, uh, it, you know, this is another area that voted no, which is, uh, which is surprising. So, um, I talked to a lot of no, no people. There was a lot of resentment towards what, uh, what the government was giving to the rebels. There was this, uh, this idea that they were giving things away. They were giving away, um, and it wasn't so much land, it was the political participation and the lack of what they saw as justice for, uh, for people who had engaged in, uh, in crimes against humanity. So the government had prioritized in the peace agreements uh, truth and reconciliation uh, over criminal justice. So if the rebels uh, were to admit to things that they had done, some people would be punished. They would be punished in such a way that they would largely be, have their, their movements restricted to a very small rural area, uh, but they would not necessarily be jailed, um, and many commanders would not, um, and, uh, or many foot soldiers would not. And, uh, and this did not sit well with the, with the Colombian uh, population, especially in areas where they had suffered from these types of attacks. Uh, so I spoke with uh, the head of the No Committee in this town, who herself was the daughter of a rebel commander, a FARC commander. Um, and she said things like this, that basically like they're, uh, the rebels got involved in drugs, they got involved in kidnappings, they, they lost the public support, and now they're just basically at the local mafia and we should not be uh, negotiating with them. And they considered any, the fact that the government even gave a seat at the table to the rebels, um, essentially gave them, as they saw, legitimacy to what they considered to be an illegitimate group. And this is, incidentally, was necessary to even get a peace accord because for the FARC to sell this accord to their own troops, they had to show that the government was treating them as equals. But that sat very poorly with, uh, with the right wing of the Colombian electorate, which is a very large part of the Colombian electorate. Um, another thing is that uh, the rebels are going to get uh, representation in Congress. Uh, the, the troops are going to get uh, kind of training to uh, be reintegrated into society. They're going to get housing. They're going to get subsidies. And these are things that a lot of people this is a poor area. A lot of uh, people here were saying they don't give it to us. We don't. We don't get housing. We don't get health care. Um, you know why should the government be giving all these things away to people who have not contributed to the country? Well, we have. Uh, I saw this one, one woman who had been displaced from El Caguan, this the area that the rebels had controlled, had lost her home, and she had been essentially homeless for a long time. She blamed the rebels, but she also blamed the government, and there was a lot of blame. Uh, on both sides, so any deal made between the government and the rebels was seen as a uh, highly suspicious. Santos uh, took advantage of this. And incidentally, he used a lot of issues that had nothing to do with the uh, plebiscite. There was a big scare, for the right anyway, about gay marriage uh, becoming legal if, uh, if uh, the rebels are reintegrated in society and you know, become a voting bloc in Congress and vote 
little bit the left, abortion as well, uh, was, a, was a major issue, this idea that you know, like everything that the religious right fears would come to pass if the rebels gain political uh, uh, legitimacy. So let me just see how we're doing in time. I should, I should finish up in a, in a little bit. So let me uh, just go, go through a couple more. Uh, we can skip this. Um, there was, I saw an increase, there was an increase in paramilitary activity in, in Tolima and probably in many other parts of the country when I was there. there were, um, these are pamphlets that, uh, uh, that would show up, or excuse me, um, flyers from the, uh, the AUC, which officially doesn't exist anymore, but, um, but largely does. They were announcing things called social cleansings, which is when they basically go in and kill anyone who they, who they don't like. Um, oftentimes not just rebels, but um, you know, men who have long hair, you know, people who are uh, you know, drug users, you know, anyone who they consider to be you know, like social undesirables. Um, these were popping up in areas um, just before the plebiscite that had been controlled or had a, a strong rebel presence, which the rebels were now leaving in preparation. Uh, for the plebiscite. Um, go to the next one. Uh, well, actually, skip that. Go to the next one. Um, the right, on it, for its part, said the FARC was putting up uh, flyers in areas that it controlled telling people to vote to vote for the peace deal. Uh, we can go to the next one. Uh, there's some voting. Let's, uh, let's just skip ahead. Uh, next, next, uh, next. So just to, to wrap it up. Um, Two things have happened since then. Uh, first of all, uh, the negotiations with the ELN have started in, in Quito. Uh, the ELN is much smaller than the, uh, the FARC. They have uh, maybe about 2,000 troops, maybe as many as 3,000. Um, uh, they're more decentralized than the FARC, which makes, uh, makes it worrisome as to how exactly this peace deal is going to go through. A lot of their, uh, their armed groups operate on a franchise model, so they, they're more democratic as they see it, but also they, uh, they don't necessarily answer to central authority. So in the case of the FARC, if Timochenko says everyone disarm, at least in theory, everyone in the FARC is going to disarm. It's not so sure that that's going to happen with the ELN. Um, the ELN has uh, been distinguished from the FARC by uh, being more uh, inspired by liberation theology. They were led by a series of Spanish priests, actually, uh, for a long time. Um, but uh, in many areas, they are involved in highly lucrative uh, uh, extortion rackets, essentially, and it would be hard to convince them to uh, uh, to give up their weapons um, to reintegrate in society for something as uncertain as what happened with the uh, with the plebiscite. The other thing that happened is uh, the uh, just about four days ago, the government and the FARC reached a second peace accord. This has not been voted on yet. In fact, it's uncertain uh, if it will be voted on after the uh, the disaster of the uh, plebiscite. People are talking about maybe this will only be ratified by Congress. It was not actually necessary for them to put this up to a popular vote. Um, the government simply wanted to do this based on a model from Guatemala, actually, um, to give it popular legitimacy. Obviously, that uh, did not work. The government also expected this to sail through. Um, the New Deal, uh, I haven't read through it entirely, but I've seen summaries. Essentially, it's, it's largely the same as the Old, old Deal. They've tweaked some, some things about transitional justice. Uh, they've been specified, you know, the, uh, for example, the peace deal would not officially be part of the Constitution, so it would be modified. It could be modified by future administrations. Um, they won't allow foreign judges to be judging uh, uh, rebels. The, uh, um, the transitional justice program would only last 10 years, but these are all tweaks. Uh, they would also not be funding, giving the rebels as much funding for their new political party. Um, but it's still, it's hard to say that this would actually satisfy the right. Currently, they're meeting with the right-wing parties in Uribe to discuss what this means, but um, I'm, I'm uncertain that this is actually going to, uh, to resolve anything. However, if it's simply put up to a vote in Congress, it's possible that they could get enough support to, uh, to push it through. So with that said, um, I'll pass it. Yeah. Pass it back. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, now I'd like to welcome uh, Charo Mina Rojas. She uh, works for the... She's a Colombian human rights activist with the National Afro-Colombian Peace Council and Black Communities Process, and she's going to be uh, joining us via Skype. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can't see you though. Can you see me up here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to be a little bit concerned about the background noise, so I want to make sure that you can hear me fine. Yes, go yeah. ahead, you're good. Okay, give me just a second, I just. Uh, but, um, 
I wanted to follow up a little bit from um, the previous presentation that there was a kind of cut off and pieces, so I couldn't get um, another word was say, but I want to, what I want to do is present um, a little bit what, how we see uh, the peace agreements from the Afro-Colombian perspective, from Afro-Colombian perspective, and particularly the ethnic commission perspective. And um, uh, where are we now? And, and talk a little bit about the ethnic chapter and what that means for that, what needs, um, what we are thinking forward. So uh, regarding the, the peace talks and the peace uh, um, agreements that uh, we have now, um, I think that one of the, the, the things that is important for us at least of how we see this is that uh, one of the reasons for uh, President Santos uh, push up for these agreements is uh, because of the free trade agreements and the economic interest that this particular administration has um, and, and in the territories where FARC was exercising uh, territorial, economic, and military control. Uh, so we part from this because um, uh, even some of one element of those agreements that has to do with the rural development and the restructuring of the, the rural economy in the country has to do with those interests that come from the free trade agreement that Colombia has with different countries, particularly with the United States, and uh, the fact that many of those interests are, interests are centered in Afro-descendant and indigenous territories, particularly Afro-descendants that are not completely protected, legally protected um, from what can come from um, these agreements. So that's a, an element um, to, to keep in mind. The other element that we would like to point out is uh, these were some agreements that came in you know, pretty good shape if you want to uh, be very positive about it, but obviously were done with no participation um, with most of the civil society, the victims, the victims didn't appeal. Uh, recognized and represented on these discussions and the, and the final agreements. There are some concerns, for instance, regarding impunity, not so much uh, uh, impunity toward the crimes committed by FARC, but the impunity for the crimes committed by the state, by the military. Uh, there is a concern about the full disappearances by the military, the extrajudicial killings of the military, which we then uh, this 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 system um, we then completely kind of recognize and embrace, and now with um, with the new conversations that they had with um, with the opposition, um, we are not sure that that uh, this this is going to be really served on this side of the responsibility and the internal conflict. Mm, um, one more element that was critical for us was um, how we present the, 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 the consistent tendency and, uh, to avoid, ignore, nor recognize the, um, the presence and the voice uh, of the indigenous and Afro-Sendant people. And this particularly because, as I said before, uh, these agreements, some of the uh, uh, agreements which had to do with um, uh, elements that are going to affect or could affect considerably the collective rights of indigenous and Afro-descendant people. Particularly for Afro-descendants, we are very concerned of how uh, uh, we can protect the territorial rights um, of, of the communities, particularly communities that haven't been recognized yet with collective title, and, and so are no completely protected, have no legal protection. So those are some of the elements of the so how we see um, uh, this process, the lack of participation for that, uh, uh, of the civil society, uh, part of the 
while we throw in the uh, in the uh, uh, Peter on October the second, the the big no votes for the no uh, uh, is a representation of uh, agreements that didn't really bring up the opportunity for Jews in Saudi to really participate in, in a direct manner. The big many people didn't saw, saw themselves represented in those agreements. Therefore, uh, they may not have voted the no, but provide uh, the arena and the conditions for that kind of, of presence um, and presentation of the agreements. Um, regarding the the ethnic chapter, um, as we saw that the, uh, the stage in the, in the park were uh, initiated conversations in Havana, we were prepared as a president, particularly BCN, um, how we need to participate in the state and make sure that we participate all. I think it's going to be a bit more now. Um, I'm at the event, a women's event, and um, it may get noisy now. I hope it, it won't interfere. So, um, we present, <laughs> we present, oh, I Um, we recognize 
that Rappers and indigenous people have their members proportionally impacted by this and conflict. We recognize their immense contribution to peace, and we consider that it's very important to uh, protect and respect the rights of the ethnic peoples. But we are going to discuss it these ones that really can approve during implementation. That's what the government wanted to say in one place. Now, uh, we managed to have a language in the ethnic chapter that ensured that um, no decision was taken without a clear consultation uh, with the indigenous and African people, that um, uh, implementation and interpretation of these agreements will be um, uh, done through the scope and the framework of, framework of the rights, the collective rights of the indigenous and African people, and that um, all the uh, international and national uh, laws and, and provisions that protect and ensure the protection of the uh, rights are um, constantly present and um, follow um, in this, uh, during the, for the interpretation, but also on the process of implementation. We had a provision there when, uh, that had to do with the uh, participation and the monitoring of the implementation and the, the, the implementation process, and for that, a uh, high-level uh, entity needs to be organized Uh, 
turn to uh, San Ho Tree. As I mentioned, he's an IPS fellow and the director of the uh, Drug Policy Project. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to uh, first uh, acknowledge some people in the room. Um, uh, Christine Espinal, who I've known since 1988. Um, she, uh, I was new at the time in town and fresh out of college, and uh, I was one of the first kids with a laser printer. <laughs> and so she asked me if I would typeset this little newsletter called the Columbia Human Rights Committee newsletter. It's coming up on our 30th anniversary. And also Andrew Miller in the back there, who uh, I went on my very first anti-Plan Columbia speaking tour with uh, in 2001 after my first trip to Columbia. Uh, we went to uh, Pacific Northwest, even Alaska, back when we had glaciers. So. <laughs> uh, and it saddens me because um, we're going to have to repeat and relitigate a lot of this stuff uh, in, this, in these coming years, I'm afraid, um, if, that, if, if worse comes to worse. Uh, to paraphrase uh, Emperor Hirohito, who at the end of World War II made a famous radio announcement to Japan, um, you know, the, the election has gone not necessarily to our advantage, and we have to endure the unendurable uh, and think the unthinkable. But uh, and the difference this time, though, is that the liberators uh, aren't liberators, they're occupiers. Um, and so in that sense, um, I want to get stick with the big picture. What I was going to talk about last week, or last Monday, is very different from what I'm going to talk about today because we're going to have to refight this house by house, block by block, um, in, in many ways. In fact, uh, a journalist called me this morning and asked me if I had any uh, insight as to who the Trump's drug czar might be. And I said, well, maybe Joseph Mengele, but I've been wrong before. Um, <laughs> it really, anything's up, uh, any, any, anything can go at this point. Uh, Colombia is and has been, especially with, a, with regard to drugs, but also the conflict in general, the mother of all simultaneous equations. If you try to solve the wrong problem in the wrong order, the wrong sequence, the wrong proportion, you make everything else worse. And that has been the case with drugs and has been the case with <laughs> everything we've talked about, right, just about. Um, and this is what happens if you don't, if you have top-down policies, you don't listen to people who are living the situation on the ground, who understand the realities better than any bureaucrat in Washington or in Bogota. Um, and, and these arrogant policies have led us to these absolute disasters and there's been a lot of failures with regard to not only drug policy but so-called alternative development um, and uh, these various other policies. Uh, and it's, I don't want to re-lose, I don't want to lose that ground again. So I'm going to keep it basic and hopefully this will be um, uh, paradigms and examples and, and things that you can take ownership of and, and put them in your own words when you go back to your uh, communities uh, or families who may not have been as enlightened as you, uh, but you might have some ammunition to go talk to other people about these things. So we've been trying to eradicate drugs for a very long time from Latin America and especially Colombia. Uh, 
but we have sprayed mm, one of the main instruments since Plan Columbia began has been the fumigation plane, the spray plane. And we've been trying in vain to defoliate our way out of this problem. Uh, we sprayed more than four million acres of one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. Um, and uh, just two years ago, the uh, World Health Organization finally came out and said that uh, the active ingredient in, in the spray that we're using, uh, called glyphosate, you could buy a very diluted form in your hardware store called Roundup, and here's the paradigm of what's going on these days, um, <laughs> is uh, you can buy a diluted form of it called Roundup. We're spraying uh, an ultra-concentrated version of this uh, at an unimaginable scale, millions and millions of gallons over, again, an incredibly delicate ecosystem. Um, and we've not been able to make any real progress. Uh, in fact, the amount of coca cultivation at the beginning of Plant Columbia, uh, it went down a little bit, but never by a lot, and now it's right back up, uh, almost to the, those peak levels again. At the peak level in 2001, there were about 220,000 hectares of coca being grown uh, in the Andean region. Uh, and we're back to about that level, almost uh, reaching those levels again. Uh, what does 220,000 hectares look like? Uh, if you translate that into square miles, it's about 849 square miles of coca. That's all the cocaine and, and coca and, and medicine and, uh, and drugs that you would need to supply the entire world can be produced on, on 841 square miles. If you take the square root of that, what that means is that all of that cocaine, the stuff that's seized, all the stuff that's used, um, can be grown on a square piece of land about 29 miles on each side. Now, Colombia is bigger than Texas and California combined. The same is true of Bolivia, the same is true of Peru, the other two coca-producing countries. Uh, so if uh, some politician said to you, we have a plan to eradicate uh, all the dandelions in California and Texas, uh, you'd think they were mad. Uh, but again, like the wall, uh, it looks good uh, when, when you say it on the stump in the campaign. Um, it's absolute madness when you see it up, in re in, in, up close in real life, right? Uh, and in fact, uh, why do we even need to go back to eradication if the wall is going to solve all our problems? But I digress. <laughs> um, so, uh, nonetheless, so, so the fumigations have temporarily stopped. The aerial spraying uh, has stopped. Uh, it might come back. It depends on who's uh, in power and makes these decisions. They're, they uh, will continue to use some of the manual spraying, which is less problematic, though still quite, quite awful. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, we can't defoliate our way out of this problem because the, 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 kind of, uh, the, the root conditions have never been addressed. Um, we've never talked about why these policies haven't worked, uh, only that more of the same needs to be done. Uh, and you can't uh, defoliate your way out of a, uh, of a problem that has very organic roots. Uh, we're asking uh, 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 farmers to do things that are very much impossible. We take for granted uh, what, what can be accomplished, right? This is the evil bush. Uh, I should say the other evil bush. Uh, uh, coca is not evil, by the way. Its, its natural state is actually quite beneficial and has a lot of good uh, functions. Uh, and this is the main instrument of our policy, historically speaking. Uh, and so, but we're, instead, uh, our pol politicians uh, have been demanding that these coca farmers stop growing coca and instead grow uh, hundreds or thousands of kilos of fruits and vegetables, as we would like them to do. Uh, that is easier said than done. Um, our politicians don't realize uh, their, 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 their shoes never get dirty, never get muddy, right? Um, and they think that uh, it's, it's easy just to have them grow pineapples instead. Um, this is a photo I took in Guaviare province. Uh, this is about uh, maybe five miles uh, outside of the provincial capital of San Jose del Guaviare. Um, and this is, leads to the rest of the province. So the rest of the province basically has to go through these kinds of roads to reach the rest of Colombia to get the access to markets. I took this during, uh, in 2009 during the, uh, the dry season. Uh, so imagine the other nine months when it rains a lot. Uh, this is the reality people have to live in, and I can't be, I, you know, I can't be more serious than, than this. Um, and if you're lucky, if you're really lucky, you're going to have a farm, farm close to this road. Right. Most farmers aren't lucky. Uh, they've been pushed farther and farther into the jungle, very often indigenous territories. That's got to be, I mean, that's got to be recognized first and foremost, that whatever solutions we talk about uh, have to respect indigenous rights. Um, and there aren't many politicians who put those rights ahead of uh, rights of other peoples. But uh, if you're, so these farmers are very often a couple of kilometers uh, sometimes away from these kinds of roads. So to grow that many pineapples or, or, uh, or plantains or whatever, and to haul that down a dirt path without a vehicle, um, to bring to the side of the road, to hope that some truck might come by, 
um, that has a little extra room and might take some money, if you have any money, to help you carry those goods to the nearest town uh, to where you try to sell this stuff. And you've got to hope that all your neighbors weren't growing the same crop because then your prices collapse. Uh, those are the kinds of realities that aren't being addressed. Right? And it terrifies me when I see press releases coming from Southcom or, or from uh, or State Department or, or congressional offices these days from very often young uh, uh, staffers or even conscripts, who knows, uh, but, but, but basically with no institutional memory. Right? And they say, oh, we're, well, we're not going to do the bad old thing. We're going to do it different this time. We'll have alternative development. We've been doing that for a very long time and doing it badly. Again, top down without consultation, without sufficient input. And so... Uh, the other problem to look at is that, yeah, okay, if we get the FARC to do lay down arms, uh, it also creates a vacuum. Uh, be careful about vacuums. If the state doesn't have capacity to fill that vacuum fairly quickly, uh, this is where you can expect, I think, a, a great escalation in violence. There's only thing one, the only thing worse than organized crime is disorganized crime. Um, and if you want an illustration of that, look at Mexico under President Calderon's drug war, right? Um, be careful, don't hit a hornet's nest uh, if you don't know what your plan B is going to be. Put another way, uh, what President Duterte is doing in the Philippines with his all out, you know, almost 5,000 people killed in just a few months of extrajudicial killings. That kind of mindless, visceral drug war uh, can suppress temporarily drug markets. Uh, but what happens, it's, it's like a tsunami, right? When the, when the water goes out, you think, oh, great, it's all tranquil, new, new land has opened up. It's the backwash that's going to kill you. Uh, and because when those drug gangs come back, they're going to have to relitigate what they can't litigate. They can't go to a judge and say, Your Honor, I've been dealing drugs in this neighborhood for 15 years, and this upstart gang took over my turf. Please kick them out. The only way they can resolve their differences is through violence or threats of extreme violence. Uh, and that's where the real bloodshed comes in. So be careful about the, 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 the backwash of these policies. Right. Um, the, uh, ultimately, we, we never take into consideration why this continues to churn year after year, decade after decade. And that has not to do with whether these are narco-terrorists, as the Bush administration called them, or, or evildoers, or what, it's about economics. Um, the problem is prohibition that takes minimally processed agricultural and chemical commodities that are literally worth pennies per dose to produce, right? That this is not difficult to make. Um, go on the internet if you want, search my name and, and the phrase shoveling water, you'll see a short video. I spent a day in the, in the jungles of Columbia with farmers making the coca paste. It's not difficult. You don't need a degree to do this. Uh, and what prohibition does is it takes these minimally processed agricultural commodities and turns into substances that are worth, uh, in some cases, worth more than their weight in gold. And, and that's why people are willing to kill uh, and to fight over these things. Put another way, uh, you can buy a kilo of pure cocaine in the streets of, uh, say, Medellin, uh, Medellin Colombia, for about $1,500, give or take. It'll fluctuate from time to time, but let's say $1,500. By the time you've got that kilo to the streets of Washington, D.C., or Baltimore, or New York, or Philadelphia, and by the time the dealers cut that kilo into little gram baggies and, and dilute it with whatever garbage they're going to stretch their profits with, you can get about $150,000 for that exact same kilogram. So what users are paying for on the streets are essentially transportation costs, or more accurately, the risks associated with transportation. Okay? Um, and so if you sent that same package by, by FedEx or DHL, it would cost you maybe 100 bucks, 200 bucks at most, right? So we have this elaborate system that causes this product to snowball in value astronomically as it reaches the final destination. Each time it crosses a border or a heavily policed area, it picks up more value. Uh, and so that the higher the risk to the individual traffickers, the higher risk premium they can, char risk premium they can charge the next person down the smuggling chain. Um, and so that when our politicians want to get tough, it sounds visceral, we've got to be strong, we've got to be tough, we get, you know, everyone says so. Uh, it, 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 what it does is it builds in tremendous value in this economy. So that the, the greater the chance the traffickers are going to get caught, uh, the longer the potential prison sentence they may, may have to serve, uh, or they might get killed, then they can charge and justify a greater uh, a cut to the next person down the smuggling chain. Right? Uh, and that's how you take something that's relatively worthless into something that is astronomically more valuable. It's a price support for drug traffickers, is what the drug war is, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, it's an indirect crop subsidy, if you will. <laughs> uh, and you'll never make these substances disappear by making them astronomically more valuable, which is what we keep on doing with these policies. Uh, the problem, though, in Washington and in Bogota is that politicians um, respond to, 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 to voters' demands, and people want easy answers, unfortunately. Um, and very often, the answers to a lot of these problems are very often counterintuitive. 
where the obvious solution, the knee-jerk solution, uh, to get a bigger stick solution, is often the wrong solution, and it makes the problem worse. Right? And we just talked about the, the problems of, of prohibition, why that makes things backfire. The other thing you got to worry about is that we keep escalating this drug war, uh, is we're causing an artificial evolution of this industry at a lightning pace. Uh, so that it is evolving at a rate far faster than, and, than anything uh, it, it, under, under normal market conditions. And so that as we throw more law enforcement at this problem, um, the kinds of people we typically capture tend to be the people who are dumb enough to get caught. No offense if anyone's ever been busted for anything, but, but the, the slang on the street is that the dealer who uses loses, right? You get careless, you get sloppy, you get apprehended. You, 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 Engage in too many turf wars. You stay on the phone too long. Uh, you you engage in uh, you know spend uh, flashy spending. You raise your profile. You brag too much on social media. Whatever, you you're the one who gets caught, right? Conversely, the person the the, the, the people we don't catch who typically escape this process are the ones who are the most innovative, the most adaptable, uh, the most cunning, uh, the smarter ones. So we create this incredible. Uh, uh, evolution, a Darwinian evolution. We've been thinning out the herd is what we've been doing for, for decades, for generations now. And you can't hope to win a war on drugs when your policies ensure that only the most efficient operations survive. And not only do they survive, but they thrive because, again, we've done two things indirectly to help them. Number one, we try to constrict the supply of drugs on the street while the, price, while the demand remains constant or even increases, thereby jacking up their prices and profits. And number two, we've picked off their competition for them. We've gotten rid of the inefficient traffickers, the clumsy traffickers, and opened up that economic space uh, to these much more ruthless and inefficient traffickers. Um, so, and, and, and going back to, uh, let's say, the 1980s, um, when, you, you know, in the 80s and 90s, when you had the, the Medellin and Cali cartels, the dreaded gigantic cocaine monopolies, right, that ruled the global cocaine industry, um, we, we fought them, and uh, we, we, we took them apart. Um, it took a lot of lives, and, 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 and a lot of, you know, many people died in the process, but you'd think that would have done the trick, right? That should have at least put a dent in the problem. Uh, and in fact, what, what that did was basically, it democratized the economy. We took out the two big monopolies that kept out the smaller actors. And soon afterwards, there were hundreds of smaller operators, sometimes uh, family-run uh, uh, boutique cartels, uh, or each of their own smuggling routes, their own list of officials they bribe. Um, we got to the point where you couldn't, you couldn't even count the number of smaller operations filling the space, uh, let alone infiltrate and, and disrupt them. So be careful what you wish for uh, in, in this case. Um, and uh, when, and, and if you have any uh, questions about the, the nitty-gritty, I can get into some of that, but I want to stick to some of the, some of the, the bigger picture stuff. Um, but in terms of uh, oh, sorry. what we've done, let me just go back and show you. Um, the eradication, uh, we've seen this some of the spray effects and stuff, uh, but the uh, consequences on the ground. This is the pasture in, in Putumayo, right? Um, and this is what it looks like after fumigation, after aerial spraying. Um, it kills anything green, basically. Uh, there's lots of scorched earth. Um, and we, in Monsanto, the manufacturers said, don't let, don't let your livestock graze on these lands once they've been sprayed. Keep your children uh, from playing in these uh, fields. But these spray plants come without warning, um, and, and for good reason, because people would start shooting at them, and they have. Uh, and so you're caught in the middle of a field, of a farm. Uh, children are playing outside, because where else are they going to be except outside during the day? Um, and you're caught in a giant gas cloud, basically. And you've got to breathe many times before you escape to get to the edge of it. Uh, so you get this in your eyes. Monsanto says this can actually cause you know, eye, uh, blindness and eye damage. Uh, so these kids aren't issued goggles. Uh, we sprayed uh, things like uh, alternative development farms project. This is aquaculture, where they grow tilapia. We teach them to grow other things. We sprayed that as well. Right? This is very imprecise uh, uh, examples here. Um, Agricultural schools funded by international development organizations, we sprayed those as well. Um, and what happens, these are plantains, uh, papayas, there's a uh, couple of oranges left in this tree, uh, which is fast dying. And this is from the uh, point of view of the children. Uh, this is from La Amiga in Putumayo. Uh, and it's a famous mural that the kids uh, made. It shows you from their perspective uh, before, during, and, and after uh, spraying. And it's important, why is this important? Well, uh, a friend of mine, uh, she's a high-profile Colombian journalist, and she was telling me years ago about interviews that she'd done in Colombia. She's been covering the conflict forever. 
and had, had interviewed the heads of the paramilitaries, the generals, politicians, presidents. She also interviewed Manuel Marilanda, the founder of the FARC. Uh, and one story she was telling me about uh, during this long interview, he kept coming back to this one story from his childhood uh, when he was a kid, and this is after the La Violencia, the previous civil war, and the military, the army came in, and they brutalized his family, uh, and they roughed, him, uh, roughed up his father, and they took his chickens. You know, do people know the story of the chickens? He kept coming back, and he kept raging throughout this interview, decades later, and they took my chickens. And my friend, she's just horrified, and I'm just thinking to herself, my God, I will buy you all the chickens in the universe if you'll stop this war. But, uh, and, and not to make this uh, reduce the complexity of, a, of, a, of an insurgency down to chickens, but there's, an, there's a lesson here. Uh, it comes from an old African proverb. Uh, the, the person who throws the punch can never remember, but the person who received the punch can never forget. Um, and when you think about the brutality of either aerial spraying or, or manual eradication, which is equally as brutal, it's up close and personal, uh, and the kinds of activities that go on in, in the name of the war on drugs to these people, um, the abuses that happen, we're creating, I fear, many, many Maralandas, and we don't know uh, what will happen 40 years down the line in terms of how they view the state and, and trust the, uh, uh, the state. Um, and uh, just to give you some examples, in uh, 2000, about a dozen years ago, I was in Putumayo, and uh, I came across by accident a, an eradication, manual eradication team. They were just switching from, uh, in this area, from aerial spraying to manual eradication. And it was a 40 men demobilized paramilitaries, which is extremely problematic. These are people who have raped and terrorized the countryside uh, for years, and now were, quote unquote, demobilized and given twice the minimum uh, wage uh, to go and basically terrorize people once again with license this time by the state. And they weren't given sufficient uh, provisions to last their, their full deployment in the field. And so they had to forage. And what do they do? They steal chickens. They steal pigs. Uh, they, they, what happens at 6 or 30 at night when the sun goes down in the tropics? People get bored. They drink. And they remember, oh, the, the farmer's uh, daughter up, this, up the road was very pretty. There are lots of rapes, lots of murders, lots of abuses that happen in the name of this. Um, and the FARC, if they are to cooperate and, and become some of the, the enforcers of the drug war now and switch sides in that, in that sense, they're not known for being gentle uh, or, or negotiating their way out of these situations. Uh, and so be careful about those kinds of seeds that get, that get replanted. Um, finally, let me uh, just conclude going back to what I originally said about Japan. And I was a former military diplomatic historian who wrote a book on the atom bomb decision. But, but at, at the end of uh, the war, the problem was uh, Japan was militarily defeated, but the United States stuck to a demand called unconditional surrender, uh, which was an impossible condition because no one knows what it means. It, it's not defined by any, it just means do everything we say, no excuses. And people don't surrender that way, right? So in the end, we had to give conditions. The emperor will not be killed, uh, you will not be enslaved, etc., etc. Now, what we've done in the war on drugs is declared a war against an enemy, um, and, and wars are about employing brute force to get a concession, a capitulation from a rational state actor, right? Country A uses its military against country B to get them to surrender or bend to its will. We have employed a war paradigm against plants. Uh, plants are not rational actors. They don't obey the laws of Congress or, or threats of the state. They obey the laws of the market. And unfortunately, the policy of prohibition creates so much value in these plants that people are willing to die and, 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 and kill for these things. And so when you think about all the individual actors involved in the war on drugs, uh, the drug economy. Uh, there is no high command that will organize, that will order a coherent capitulation, a surrender. Right? There's no one in the in, in, in the, there's no grand conspiracy the, uh, where the, 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 the pulsating brain at the center of the spider web says, "Okay, all, all you people who are growing coca, stop growing. All you traffickers, stop trafficking. You money laundering, stop money laundering. You users, stop using. Dealers, stop dealing." There is no high command to call a surrender. And so for decades, for generations, we have literally been declaring a war against an enemy who is incapable of surrender. So when President Trump talks about declaring wars on problems, be careful, um, especially if there are wars against enemies that can't surrender. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> at this time, I'd like to open up for a question and answer session. Uh, so if anybody has any questions for our uh, panelists. <clears throat> Uh, it's just chilling, um, especially the parallels between Colombia and the U.S. when 
Michael was talking about the rise in the paramilitary and the thinking about the militias that you're hearing more about in the U.S. Um, it's scary. And I was wondering, I mean, Sanjo, you made a couple of jokes about it, but has Trump said anything about drug war specifically, drug policy, or? Uh, uh, not really during the campaign. Um, and this is the... <laughs> This is the ray of hope. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's nothing to do with Colombia. It has to do with marijuana, right? And so he said, uh, but, but keep in mind, he's been on every side of every issue, literally, right? So who knows what the real Trump thinks? But during the campaign, he said that he would respect states' rights with regard to marijuana. Uh, and now that we have um, all these states, and, and keep in mind, election night, eight out of nine marijuana initiatives passed. Arizona was the only one that didn't, and because there was a lot of outside money and, and really sleazy advertising. but. Nonetheless, it is incredibly popular. This was also the case in, in uh, 2012, that marijuana was more popular than Obama or Romney, um, and in this election as well, right? M more popular than either of the two candidates, uh, and politicians listen to that. So with the selection of the new drug czar, I would hope uh, that that would be taken into consideration in terms of states' rights. Unfortunately, they're going to interpret states' rights in, in the old bad, bad way as well, uh, in the 1960s uh, way. But uh, nonetheless, the, it, 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 when it comes to picking a drug czar, um, I think Trump, uh, if any of his other nominees or, or names that have been floated or suggestion, will pick the worst. But if this is one of those weird cases where uh, uh, Wright's previous and Steve Bannon might actually be moderating influences, I can't believe I just said this, because they understand the popularity of, of, of marijuana and the frustration with the drug war uh, throughout the country. So that might be a moderating influence. I don't know. It's just way too early to say, and these people are nuts. Yes. Oh. No, please. Oh, okay. Uh, Sanjo, do you have any idea how it's going to be the new policy for Colombia? No. Uh, but uh, I think it, it's fair to say, if you could have built a wall, then why would you need to do anything else? Right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no. Uh, it, the problem is that you've got a, a bunch of, of, of visceralists in office. All the names that have come out so far in terms of the nominations and directions have been very visceral. Uh, and, and he could have gone the other way, but, but right now he's surrounding himself with these, you know, really knee-jerk people. And the uh, problem is that when you see a country, a situation that's on fire, whether it's Mexico or Colombia, there's lots of violence and conflict, etc., and drugs, the knee-jerk solution, of course, is to throw water onto the fire. Water being a metaphor for military and security assistance, a bigger stick, right? And that's common sense for politicians, right? You have a fire, you throw water onto a fire, right? Common sense. Anyone ever had a grease fire in their kitchen? Uh, or electrical fire? Uh, you don't want to use water, right? And in fact, it's counterintuitive to think the way you deal with that kind of fire is you cut off the oxygen. You put the lid onto the pot, right? And you cut off the oxygen. And the oxygen in this case is drug prohibition that makes these substances so incredibly valuable and demand. So it's demand reduction and ending prohibition, I think, are the ways to, to address this problem. Uh, and I think that might be too far a stretch for Donald Trump's mind. I, I hope not. We'll see. Um, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, following up on what you said about uh, failures in U.S. policy, and, and maybe this is to all of you, especially in Charo as well, how the U.S. has dealt with Colombia historically. Would you, uh, after a while, you don't see it as a failure. You just see it as, some people would say it's an accident according to plan. That is not, this is the Ghanaian phrase. <laughs> That it's uh, after a while you start saying, okay, who have they been aligned with, and who has been beneficial to these policies? Uh, consistently, it's been to the detriment of Afro descendants, indigenous people, <coughs> and to the um, the corporations that benefited the most. So after a while, we start saying it's not really a failure of a policy, or is it really a policy that's designed <coughs> to be this way? And I wanted to hear from all of from all three. Of <coughs> I don't know if Charles wants to go. Uh, she's still on. She's still on. Are you there, Charles? Charles? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. She has to go? Yes. Charles, go ahead and answer the question. If you like. Okay, okay. If, if I hear correctly, uh, it was asking about these policies, if they are a failure or misused, uh, right? Is that the question? Yeah, if it's a failure or really just a, it's, it's the, what they're supposed to, they're designed to be this way. 
I, I think it's both in some sense, right? Uh, um, in some ways, it, 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 it's a failure because um, a, what the goal of this, the goal of this policy is obviously having the immigration, more the immigration the way that are, they are uh, uh, happening as, as it was presented. Um, but um, we do see that most of this is, is kind of set to be this way, you know? Um, the rural growth has a specific reason to be uh, set on the economic interests of the United States, or in this case, uh, Colombia, uh, economic interests, but also military, militarized interests. This is related to economic and militarization. And um, uh, none of these things that are put in place um, are used um, out of, it's not like they haven't been planned in a certain way to be what they are, right? Uh, all the arms, all the uh, chemicals, all the instruction, all the money that have been given to Colombia have been back to the um, uh, United States one way or another, right? Uh, the chemicals are both from the United States, the instructions come from the United States, um, uh, the money from the USAID goes to uh, intermediaries that come from the United States, so we know that all that money comes here and it's all over the time. But at the same time, you know, those policies have been impacted precisely in, the, in our case, the people that sit in the middle of those interests. Uh, when you talk about immigration, you really look what happened with immigration in Colombia. It was happening with an indigenous and mostly a person that you recorded, impacting the body traps of people and the focus of people. So, yeah. You have to look to the Cauca uh, in areas that are patrolled by military. You see the whole mountain uh, grow with coca that is not fumigated. Instead, you see the plantain, the yuca, the medicinal plant completely burned out. That was what was innovation. And what that, that caused was a huge internal displacement. Most of the displacement that were happening between late 90s and uh, 2005 were caused by the fumigation uh, and the presence of federal militaries that were serving this policy. So we don't think that this is casual or it's just a, a failure. There is certain failure for sure, but most of this has to do with how has been planned to uh, ensure and regain control of some areas. And at some point, what uh, is clear is that it's not giving the result that it needs to get, and this is why this stops coming to play because now this is kind of the next step that needs to be followed in this process uh, to make sure that economic, uh, economic policies and all these federal interests and policies are in place. So uh, I think that mostly it's uh, part of the plan. And they haven't been as successful as was expected, I think. Thank you. So I think there, there are two levels to deal with this, right? Uh, one is the level of, of the grand uh, conspiracy, and I don't mean to imply that you're engaged in conspiracy theory, but I'm just saying in terms of was this a grander plan? And at the, at the, on the ground level, or at the more local level, a more direct level, there's a whole other game being played in terms of opportunism and people scheming and grab, land grabs and corruption and all that stuff. And, and there's a lot of very predictable behavior at that level, right, in terms of um, uh, you know, there are 7 million people internally displaced in Colombia out of a population of, what, 45 million these days? Approximately 7 million are internally displaced. There have been so many land grabs by both paramilitaries, landowners, guerrillas, everyone has been involved in pushing people <laughs> off land and is stealing lots of land. Uh, but for what purposes? Uh, it's certainly in the short run, African palm, coca, cattle, mining, uh, but in terms of the bigger mega projects and stuff, um, it's difficult to see how there's continuity of policy over many, many, many years and administrations. No one could have predicted what happened with the plebiscite or with the Trump vote or all these other things. 
it's very hard to, to project that far out. Um, and when you look at how, and I had the privilege, I guess, of, of following Plan Columbia from beginning conception to, to implementation and failure. Uh -huh. But uh, in, in terms of that, it, the, the, the idea that the planner might have in the planning, uh, policy planning staff, and uh, in, in State Farm, for instance, might be one thing. By the time it's shopped around and within the State Department to all the different branches, it's going to have lots of push and pull, and, and different interests are going to change that. By the time it goes into agency within the administration, um, you've got DOD and, and Commerce and, and AID and others, human rights people pushing and pulling and, and, and twisting that policy around. Then it gets shopped over to Congress. You've got two houses of Congress, you've got multiple factions, you've got the lobbyists, and they want this kind of, this kind of focus on, on helicopters, deploy this region, whatever. Uh, and by the time it's finally implemented on the ground, years later, um, it can have very little resemblance to what the planner's original thought was. So in that sense, uh, I tend to be more skeptical about that, that level of it. But as you get closer to the ground and as you get into a more immediate level, there's lots of people with I mean, the parasites come out of the woodwork. Uh, and we should have learned through Afghanistan and Plan Colombia uh, and Iraq that if you drop billions of dollars of foreign aid, uh, or, or military aid into a country, into an environment that doesn't have the absorptive capacity, it's, it's, you're basically calling a dinner bell for every, every parasite from, <laughs> within a thousand miles. Uh, and it, like, this is what we've witnessed uh, with, with this. Uh, Michael, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on what you see as the future options uh, for FARC, uh, hopes for them, or what do you think is going to happen? Do you see them becoming increasingly decentralized if referendums can't get passed? Or? Uh, yeah, basically there's uh, it's kind of like a ticking time bomb. People on the yes side are saying, like, we need to get a deal and we need to get ratified now because the longer we wait, uh, the longer the troops, the, the FARC troops, are going to get restless. Um, you know, they, they've been operating, uh, you know, by you know, doing what they do through, uh, you know, through, through armed force to, you know, to survive, to get what they need. And, uh, and right now they're, they're on ceasefire. They have been on ceasefire on and off since 2002 when the... Uh, the negotiation started, and already you're starting to see people kind of break off and start extorting people. You, I mean, they used to call it uh, when they would um, institute tax, they called them uh, vaccines, vacunas. Um, but uh, but you know, they used to call it like a war tax, and now they're calling it a peace tax. But like, there are groups that are going around and like, you know, and people would say like, but you know, we heard that we heard that you guys you know signed a peace deal, and they would go tell the people like, well, we didn't sign anything. So you're going to start seeing more of that. The FARC is more disciplined than the ELN. I think I'm worried that the ELN will be, uh, you know, even harder to uh, to keep in line. Um, but basically, the longer this uh, this goes on, uh, the more that you'll see um, elements of the rebels kind of merge. And you're already seeing them cooperate, actually, oddly enough, with ex-paramilitaries. Um, these groups that the Colombian government calls Bakking uh, criminal gangs, um, which are essentially just you know like armed groups that have stopped calling themselves the, by the names of those groups, but still engaging in extortion. Um, so yeah, there needs to be a plan. It needs to be implemented soon, um, and people need to be the, the troops need to be, uh, you know, uh, demobilized and you know helped reintegrated into society as quickly as possible. Uh, you also mentioned that um, that they didn't necessarily need a referendum or a popular vote to get this um, yeah. uh, issue passed. Um, is there any talk about sort of skipping that, or is it too late now that since they've already put out a referendum first? It, it looks. Charles mentioned this too. Um, it, it looks like uh, they're going to try to get it through Congress rather okay. than, and in which case it's, it has a much greater much likelihood of passing. Okay. We have time for our, uh, one more question. Uh, get Manuel. And yeah. Is the text that Charo was referring to is it already published? or you were referring only to what uh, Santos was referring to? It's, it's, uh, it's about 300 pages long, so it's, 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 it's a little bit longer than the previous oh, okay. agreement. Okay. 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 Right. One more, then. Yeah. Um, it's like you were talking about the um, ceasefire, and yesterday was a violation of the mm -hmm. ceasefire, and the gorilla were killed yesterday. Uh, that's why we need to move in Colombia, we need to move as fast as we can because it's going to be very difficult. And um, I know this is the intentions of Uribe. He doesn't want any agreement. He doesn't want any peace in Colombia because for him it's better to continue with the war. And um, the other problem with the, the wall of the plebiscite was that um, he started campaign. What's campaign? I mean, he's in campaign for next uh, period, mm -hmm. presidential period. And he started campaign three years ago, and he went, 
town by town. town. He went and talked to the people. He went and talked to the to the religious people from the no Catholic from the opera, the other religious group. And he started to talk with these people and start to lie about different things in the agreement. And one of the things that he said is that don't go, uh, yes, because uh, they're going to remove the money from the uh, retired people and give the money to the gorillas. Okay. Uh, don't go for the agreement because they are going to support the, the, the lesbians and the gays, and then this is going to be the ideology of the general that they call, and then everybody in the school, the children in the school, they are going to become homosexuals. And he lied a lot, and he is in campaign. It's not, it's not, yeah. but he's now in campaign since mm -hmm. the beginning. He yeah. was doing campaign. And with Santos as popular as he is, it's, yeah. it's very likely that the right wing will win the 2018 elections, not, mm -hmm. you know, Rivas terminated it out, but whoever the, uh, you know his his candidate is, and there's a large portion of the country that just votes for whoever exactly. Uribe names. He's incredibly powerful. Yeah. I'm just testing that that Christina knows more about this stuff than all of us put together. <laughs> uh, but but I want to ask you: Is it fair to say that Uribe's trick was that he made this instead of a plebiscite about the war, uh, a vote about the popularity of the FARC, which they can't possibly win? I mean, switching the the, the frame. The frame that he okay. The thing is that you know that Uribe hates FARC yeah. because FARC kill his father. And he don't want in any way that the FARC have any, any, um, anything for them. They want to defeat the FARC, and that is not possible to defeat mm -hmm. the FARC because yeah. they, are, they were in the negotiation, the table and talking. But yeah, that it's, uh, he, he doesn't want, he doesn't want peace in Colombia. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, no, just if, if I'm hearing correctly what you are saying about Uribe, I, and I guess that it can be also my personal remarks. But um, it, you see, I think that, as I would say, I think we have to be careful what we, um, what we wish for. And for African and people, um, peace is very, very important. It's very necessary. We urge, you know, uh, the, the, the need for uh, peace talk, we all need to start that with the and reach some agreements and be uh, with paramilitaries to finally be in peace. But I think that we all, here in Colombia, and the United States, you know, around the world, I think, we have to be very careful from this kind of push out this this resolution of the, of this uh, uh, right, Right wing forces that are taking place like this kind of regaining power, you know, and that is what is picturing Colombia. So uh, uh, I think uh, Uribe uh, certainly has been a campaign, you know, he, he left that presidency the second time and he never left the really uh, campaign and trying to be back in power and he has tried so hard for this. And um, what we can see probably is that. Not only part of the force, but the reorganization of a serious opposition um, a, with the process of these talks again, what he wants to put in place. Now, uh, we have to be careful because we are really already up here, but I don't know, uh, in the last couple of days, you know, we saw a new thing that part the military were against. And in the territory, and and the So, uh, this can take uh, uh, a very to people to believe that this agreement had a big mistake and that the for us, what is left is to. Continue organizing and uh, traveling. I don't know what is going to happen there with Trump. Well, that has to be for us, remains to be uh, part of the analysis that we have to put in place. But we know for sure that if during Obama period, human rights was kind of in the loop, or that kind of diet, you know, this the loop, it's going to be more complicated now with uh, this country. But don't say much about it.
Just uh, keep continuing with the closing remarks. I understand who Michael can go first. Um, so I can't talk about the drug uh, uh, drug issue. That's a uh, that's bigger picture than uh, what I can talk about, just in terms of the deviant political context. It is uh, uh, it is very worrisome that uh, there hasn't been a peace deal in place uh, up to now. It's going to get worse the longer there hasn't been uh, been one. Um, politically, in terms of how why people voted the way they do, I have a, my personal theory is that uh, I mean everyone was affected by the conflict, so it wouldn't it'd be wrong to say that the people who voted against it, you know, like don't want peace, don't care, you know, they keep, they said, you know, like one of their great, uh, you know, uh, resentments uh, was the way that they were being portrayed as, you know, against peace in general, whereas they say they are against the terms of the peace. Now, of course, they were being fed a number, uh, you know, there were a number of lies coming from the, uh, the opposition campaign, but I do believe there's sincerity on all sides for peace. Um, it's just a matter of uh, uh, how they're going to get it. Incidentally, um, you saw kind of uh, what uh, in political science world called Bradley effect here. Um, everyone was talking about how, you know, like, People needed to vote yes, you know, like, and there, the Colombian government, the Catholic Church, the UN, the US, the EU, um, and that's probably one of the reasons why the polls were so wrong. Um, there are probably a lot of people who, uh, you know, were ashamed to admit that they were voting no, and so they didn't tell the pollsters they did, and then they ended up voting yes. Another thing that we might think is, you know, may have happened somewhat in, in this election. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, the longer we wait, uh, the uh, the worse it's going to get, and also the more armed groups, including the ALN, will be tempted to uh, <coughs> to engage more armed activity because um, in the past, before they have entered in negotiations, they have tried to enter into negotiations from a position of strength, uh, which is by engaging in attacks. So uh, right after the uh, 2014 elections, on election day, uh, there was an ELN attack uh, in the state next to Iowa where they... Uh, ambushed an army patrol, killed 15 troops, took a bunch of uh, election workers hostage. And this was because they were anticipating going to talk to the government. They didn't want to be seen as weak. Uh, so as long as things stall, there will be more incentive for, uh, for groups to, uh, you know, to show their strength, so to speak. What, whatever happens in, uh, going forward in terms of so-called alternative development uh, or, or eradication, keep in mind why people are doing what they're doing, right? So for years we've been demanding that these farmers, instead of growing coca, grow uh, all these fruits and vegetables living on a couple of dollars a day, to transport these vegetables and fruits on vehicles they don't have, over roads that literally don't exist, to sell in markets both domestic and export they can't get access to, and very often, uh, if they can, they have to compete against cheap agribusiness imports, very often subsidized by our tax dollars through these wonderful free trade deals, against which these farmers don't stand a chance. Then the politicians bring in forced eradication, right? whether it's aerial spraying or manual eradication. Uh, but when you destroy these people's livelihoods in the course of an afternoon or a morning, um, and I've had the great misfortune of having to witness this, and it's, it's a very traumatizing thing, but what they, it forces them into food insecurity, right? and, it pan and, the, and instant panic sets in. Because the number one question is, how am I going to feed my children uh, tomorrow or next week or next month or next year? Um, and it's not, food insecurity is not something we have to deal with very much in our country, right? Uh, at least not here. But, it, and, and so then it raises the most profound question. What is the one crop they know how to grow that doesn't require a lot of infrastructure, that doesn't require uh, lots of permits and, and experience? Um, uh, and of course, those are the illicit crops. This is why the cycle never breaks, right? You can't deal with, not, you can't ignore food insecurity. You can't ignore that period uh, when, in, in contrast, Look at what we've done, look what the Bolivians have done in spite of the US and the EA. They've legalized traditional coca planting for traditional purposes, it's regulated, uh, but what they've done is guaranteed a small but moderate income for these farmers. With that, uh, you get predictability and certain uh, economic sense of security. That is how you get people to diversify away from coca. So I've been to these small villages in the Chapari region, for instance, in Bolivia, uh, and watched over many years how uh, they went from very poor, impoverished towns that have suffered the brutal effects of, of forced eradication year after year after year. When Evo Morales comes in, this new policy takes effect. 
people suddenly ha don't have to worry about food insecurity, right? And so they can take that little bit of money they get from their predictable coca plot, and they can invest it into something else. You have some cooking skills, you open a little cafe. You maybe open a little guest house, or, or you're good at car repair, you open a repair shop. That's how you get diversification of local economies, not by using a big stick and eradication and forcing people into food insecurity. Right? It's counterintuitive, but think of, the, think of the Great Recession here. When you didn't know if tomorrow would be a better day, when nothing was certain but uncertainty, you weren't going to invest. You weren't going to diversify. You were going to hunker down the best way you knew how. Right? And that's, these farmers are acting in their own self-interest, and it's completely logical. All right. Uh, great. Thank you. Do we have more time? Or? Before you go, I want to show you the territory of the pain. Wow. Oh, nice. I want to go to the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you to our panelists, uh, Charo, uh, Michael, and Sanjo, and thank you all for coming. Um, thank you. Thank you.